you everyone for joining us today. I have the very difficult task to keep you here until lunch, but I think our conversation will make up uh, for the food that is waiting on the, for you on the other side. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, a special thank you before I get started for our great events team and AV team who have made all of this possible, without which we would not have chairs or mics or anything for uh, our program today. So please join me in giving them a hand. I'm Ananya Kumar, I'm the Associate Director at the Atlantic Council. I lead our Future of Money work, which includes this tracker, but also includes thinking beyond CBDCs into what a future system of money is going to look like. Uh, through our work over the last few years, uh, but also through the working paper that was uh, released yesterday, uh, we've seen the rapid development of digital currency projects around the world. What has become very evident to us over the last year is that future systems, regardless of what they look like, and you've seen a lot of views here about what they will look like uh, today already, but whatever they look like, they're going to need to speak to each other. To me, that is what interoperability means, but today in our panel, we're gonna get into whether or not my panelists agree with me <laughs> on that. We're gonna get into some of the technical and legal issues that arise uh, when they work on their projects. Um, we're going to look at some of the challenges that arise, but also some of the opportunities that they're looking at, uh, looking into the future. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, an esteemed slate of panelists today. Um, Federica Greenberg from the, uh, the IMF, he's a senior economist here, um, and he'll be representing the IMF. Tony McLaughlin, who's the head of Emerging Payments and Business Development at Citibank. Tom Jacques, who's a Chief Innovation Officer at SWIFT. Uh, Jennifer O'Rourke, uh, who's the Executive Director of Innovation Strategy at DTCC. And virtually joining us from Boston is Jordan Bleischer, who is the Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary of Domestic Finance at the US Department of Treasury. Thank you all for being a part of this today. And uh, because I gave my definition of, of interoperability, I want to turn to Jennifer first for her definition of interoperability and why DTCC is interested uh, in this issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when we think about interoperability, what we're talking about from our point of view is the sharing and the coordination of disparate data across multiple participants, right? So I think that that's pretty easy to conceptualize. Uh, where this gets important quite quickly is how we're seeing interoperability and the connective tissue between these distinct disparate systems, how we're seeing that interoperability develop. And right now today, um, what, when we look to the projects that have already been moved into significant degrees of research and experimentation, or are currently on a path to production, what we're seeing across the globe are smaller DLT deployments uh, at subscale that have isolated liquidity pools and therefore are finding themselves creating a fragmented marketplace because of some of the technology choices of proprietary DLTs that have been taken in earlier days and are being taken today. This disparate marketplace is going to challenge our ability for a harmonized global solution, but the answer to that is going to be interoperability. So for that reason, I'm very excited to participate in this conversation today. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Jordan, who's on screens behind us, that our audience can see. Um, I'm interested from a public policy perspective, Jordan, what is the need for interoperability and um, how do you define it? Right, so thank you, Ananya. Um, when we think about interoperability uh, at the most basic level, really what we're thinking about is the ability um, to make something happen in one system um, through another system. So in the context of payments, uh, interoperability exists when I can initiate a payment at my institution and funds are credited to you at your institution. Um, when we think about security settlement, uh, you can think of interoperability as the, as the ability to coordinate a transfer in the ownership of securities, um, usually recorded on a securities ledger, 
uh, with the transfer of money um, typically recorded on a, on a payments ledger. Um, when we think about why interoperability matters, I, I think it can be helpful uh, to compare interoperability with the alternatives. Um, so one alternative would be a world of proliferating silos that, that can't speak to each other. Um, uh, this would be a world of high transaction costs and limited gains from trade. Uh, a second alternative on the other end of the spectrum um, would be a world of highly concentrated walled, walled gardens. Uh, and this could develop into a world of monopoly rents, limited competition, and general stagnation. Um, and so when we think about interoperability and why it matters, um, we think of it as kind of being a middle path between uh, these extremes. I think for domestic payments, we often take interoperability for granted, um, but it's important to acknowledge that in domestic payments, interoper interoperability is an achievement um, that's rooted, among other things, in central bank money and central bank payment systems. Um, and when we think about fast payment systems, uh, one of the benefits is to reinforce interoperability in domestic payments um, by allowing customers of different institutions to transfer value to each other. Uh, looking forward, um, you know, of course, we're considering the emergence of new forms of digital money and payments, um, and the impact on interoperability remains to be seen. So on the one hand, CBDCs, tokenized deposits, stable coins, um, could provide new ways of transferring value across payments networks, mm -hmm. bolstering interoperability. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the rise of new forms of privately issued money and payments could also lead uh, to the extremes I, I mentioned earlier, either a proliferation of silos um, or heavily concentrated walled gardens. Um, thinking about cross-border payments, uh, there we tend to take interoperability much less for granted. Um, quite the contrary, cross-border payments were often slow, costly, opaque, uh, and these frictions are particularly um, significant for emerging and developing market economies. Uh, as you well know, um, there are a number of proposals for how to address frictions in cross-border payments. Um, some would involve interlinking fast payment systems, bilaterally, regionally, multilaterally. Uh, there are also proposals to create new multi-currency platforms um, using technologies like tokenization and DLT. Uh, and here I would just point out that many of the frictions in cross-border payments ultimately stem um, from some combination of legal, legal, regulatory, or other policy issues. Uh, and while technology can help, uh, it may not be a, a silver bullet where these sorts of issues are at play. Um, finally, just very briefly, um, on multi-asset settlement, um, as I suggested at the very beginning, um, security settlement uh, involves uh, coordinating the transfer of securities, uh, usually on one ledger with money, usually on another. Um, and for this reason, it's worth exploring whether there are efficiency gains um, from new technologies that could support better coordination between these distinct ledgers. Um, alternatively, and more far-reaching, uh, would be proposals that involve putting money and securities onto a single unified ledger. Um, and while potentially very transformative, um, you know, sort of much like the common platforms for cross-border payments, uh, unified ledger proposals may also raise complicated legal, regulatory, and policy questions. Thank you, Jordan. And we're going to get into uh, some of the issues that you raised there, unified ledger versus uh, cross bridges across ledgers. Um, Cross-border payments have been evoked, so it's only appropriate that I turn to Tom for uh, his definition of interoperability and why he sees SWIFT work so much on this issue. Well, thanks for, um, thanks for having me. I, I love when, when the, we talk about cross-border payments and the opportunity to kind of get the message out. And, and from Swift's point of view, interoperability is kind of the heart of what we do. You know, we turned 50 years old this year, and we started because domestic payment systems couldn't talk to each other. And so to standardize that messaging and to put the flows in place um, was, was critical, you know, for, for moving value and really driving economic value around, around the globe. And that's, that's true today. And as we look forward into the creation of new digital assets, whether that's a CBDC and a, 
and a digital form of the currency or tokenized uh, bank deposits or, or other types of assets, what we see is, 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 is we need to actually focus on interoperability because we're not just going to walk in one day and kind of flip the switch and everybody's going to be on a, on a shiny new platform. You know, I think we counted 60 plus um, real-time payment systems and projects going on in the world today, right? And they're all going to be at different stages and different times. So you need the interoperability from our point of view for a number of reasons. One of the most important ones is we need the interoperability and connectivity to existing payment rails. And so if you're creating a new network and new digital asset and you don't have access to existing payment rails and no way to connect to what's there already, then you're going to build a digital island and you won't drive adoption. Uh, and you create even more fragmentation. And then we'll be sitting here five years from now and saying, well, we did your digital assets, you know, we just didn't focus on interoperability first, and now we have all these great functionality in pockets or walled gardens, as, as was just said, uh, but they don't talk to each other. So we basically just created um, the same problems or worse with new technology. And I don't think anybody wants that. So it's really kind of the heart of what we do and, and, and major focus for the work that we're doing in CBDCs and other digital assets. Thank you, Tom. And, and often when I think about interoperability, what helps me is to be able to think about it in two ways, horizontally and vertically. So uh, the thing that you just said, which is that systems need to operate with current systems that already exist, but also the new ones that are going to come up over time need to be interoperable um, across each other. So something that helps me think about this issue. Um, Federico, I want to turn to you for a domestic perspective on interoperability, you interact with member countries uh, who are part of the IMF. What are some of the macrofinancial concerns uh, that you're seeing come up um, and that your organization is interested in looking at? Thank you, Anya, and thanks for, for having me here. Um, so of course we have 190 countries in our yeah. membership, <laughs> so we hear a lot of different issues, a lot of uh, special <laughs> contexts and, and struggles, but there, I'd say that it's a common theme across uh, all countries that we see new technologies uh, and new business models that drive uh, basically the creation of new forms of money, new forms of payment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that opens the door, as, as uh, the other panelists were, were saying, uh, open the possibility for new efficiencies, more competition, more access, reaching to some niches of the population or, or corporates that are maybe underserved. And, and that's great. And everyone gets excited about it. Uh, but of course, that has to be balanced against the financial stability risks that new forms of money may create. And that goes from operational and cyber specifically that can, of course, create uh, systemic disruptions, but also more traditional types of risk like banking disintermediation, right? So we all want to preserve the ability of the financial system to continue lend, uh, create credit for the economy and lend to corporates. Uh, and that creates, of course, trade-offs that have to be managed very carefully. Uh, one easy example is our CBDCs, right? If we were to create a CBDC that is amazing, has all the features that we'd like and everyone wants to use it, well, that would crowd out uh, bank deposits, right? And may make banks' uh, life a bit harder uh, and the role in the economy uh, a bit more limited. At the same time, you don't want to create a CBDC that no one uses mm -hmm. because that is basically, I mean, why, right? So central banks would... Uh, spend taxpayer resources and would have uh, reputational risks down the line. That also has uh, applies to, <coughs> excuse me, private forms of money, uh, e-money, and stable coins. Mm -hmm. I mean, make the, making those interoperable domestically also can create uh, risks that have to be managed, um, and that's where regulation comes in and standards and appropriate supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you ask about domestic, but I cannot avoid, I mean, we have an international at the beginning of our, <coughs> our name. Uh, of course, across borders, it's a major issue yep. for us, uh, reaping the benefits of new forms of money, new solutions for better integration of countries is critical, mm -hmm. but at the same time, avoiding <coughs> creating excessive volatility of flows uh, and new forms of I mean, uh, spillovers. Uh, mm -hmm. Contagion is obviously very important as well, and that's something that our membership cares a lot about. Thank you. I'm going to move on to some of the projects that some of you are involved in and, and what, how you're thinking of interoperability and how, uh, what the challenges are to it has evolved. So I'm going to turn to you, Tony, uh, if you can brief us a little bit about the regulated liabilities network uh, and the proofs of concepts that were released in 2022 and 2023. How has your thinking of interoperability changed through doing those projects? Yeah, thank, thank you. So 
The, the concept of uh, re regulated liability network is really an investigation into the application of distributed ledger technology to regulated financial services. And if I just pause there for a second, it's entirely not obvious that DLT is a good technology for the regulated space because we have to remember that DLT was created as the antithesis mm -hmm. of regulated financial services and not in order to augment it. Mm. So the first thing that you have to do if you want to apply DLT to the regulated space is you've got to put a number of fundamental blockchain mm. constructs into the garbage. We don't want non-sovereign currency units. We don't want commodity forms of money. We don't want proof of work. We don't want anonymity. <coughs> we don't want tokenomics. We don't want economic systems which are outside of the regulatory perimeter. So if you, if you ditch all that stuff, <laughs> what's left? <laughs> <laughs> And there is a kernel of stuff which is left because the way you get to that is to ask yourself, what does Ethereum do better than the traditional financial sector? And that's where you find some really intriguing possibilities. Number one, um, Ethereum is 24 by seven. Now that I wouldn't say is a unique feature of a, of a blockchain. You can do that on a different yeah. technology, so, but it's true that that Ethereum's running 24 by seven and almost nothing in traditional financial services is. The second thing is more is deeper and more interesting, which is that Ethereum is multi-asset. And the truth is that the financial system that we've built up over decades is fundamentally siloed. So let's just take a, a microscope and look at the US. You've got Fedwire for, Fedwire for for cash, which only knows central bank dollars. Fedwire for securities, which only knows treasuries. DTCC knows investment grade bonds and other uh, securities. So we have built up separate islands and every financial institution is, is its own data island and its own individual um, you know, record keeping platform. So what DLT suggests to us is what if we move away from that paradigm and have a place where these assets can meet, these multiple assets can meet and be settled within the context of a financial market infrastructure, an, an FMI? And that's essentially what Regulated <coughs> Liability Network is investigating is, can we have a new financial market infrastructure? And again, let's not gloss, o gloss over that point mm -hmm. because People do lots of hand-waving about blockchain and claim that it achieves atomic settlement, but blockchains don't achieve any form of settlement. Settlement is a legal construct. A blockchain might evidence settlement within a legal construct, within a legal framework, but it doesn't achieve legal settlement. You need an FMI, you need a legal framework. So can we have a, a new financial market infrastructure that's running some kind of DLT or shared ledger and in that DLT or shared ledger, the different financial assets can be settled 24 by seven in real time with absolute cryptographic certainty of who owns what. Um, that's regulated liability network. We've done proof of concept here in the US. The results were published on the 6th of July. There's a very active community around it in the UK where we will be examining retail use cases and, um, and, 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 and frankly what it is, is it's trying to move beyond CBDC. Yeah. Um, CBDC is a monoline focus on one aspect of the sovereign currency system, which is the central bank money. Um, we think that there's a broader opportunity to upgrade the whole of the sovereign currency system by having infrastructures where commercial bank money, central bank money, e-money, regulated stable coins and other assets can meet and be exchanged within uh, given legal structure. That's RLM. Thank you, Tori. I, I think it's very interesting because when I talk to central banks, a few years ago, the conversations we were having were whether or not they should <coughs> use DLT. And I think we've progressed past that bit of conversation to be talking about what are the aspects of DLT that are going to be useful to my
product uh, and my objectives and what are not and how do we discard uh, the, the aspects that we don't want and build upon the aspects that are better than existing systems. Right. So that's a very good, um, I think, learning for us to take as we, we go beyond this conversation as well. Um, Jennifer, I want to give you some time to uh, talk a, a little bit about your uh, security settlement pilot uh, as well as testnet. Yeah, thank you. So um, we are here today at a conference that is co-hosted by the Digital Dollar Project and I'm incredibly proud to say that uh, about a year ago now, I think it's been, we completed the first DDP pilot, DTCC and the Digital Dollar Project did, mm -hmm. where we were exploring DVP as a use case for security settlement with a central bank digital currency. This was an incredibly successful uh, experiment where we were able to create a technology solution with a multi-network approach that was able to then show what the trade-offs would be with this particular approach and some of the architectural decisions that we made. And the reason why that's so important is because there are so many open issues around these architectural decisions right now. And that's really what we're talking about on this panel right now, is how do we connect networks that have been built up with different architectural approaches in mind? So for our pilot, we were looking at two single asset networks, DTCC representing the future of a tokenized security in one network, and then a synthetic central bank digital currency network that represented a future USD CBDC. And we were able to successfully settle that DVP use case in a variety of different scenarios. What that led us to really appreciate from a DTCC point of view is that although we will support whatever architecture that we find to be the predominant one within the market and that our clients are using, or we will support a multitude of those architectures, period. But what we are finding right now is that a pragmatic approach to this architecture is going to recognize that the toothpaste is out of the tube. And there already are single asset networks that exist today. And DTCC's job as financial market infrastructure or an FMI is to support connecting those networks together. So that's the work that we're, we have done in our digital dollar project um, security settlement pilot. And that is the work that we're continuing to do with our test net, which is essentially a sandbox environment that we currently have up and running for Hyperledger Bezu, but we have um, a roadmap that will expand to additional protocols, additional networks. And we will then be able to test out the use cases that our clients are prioritizing and focused on and to figure out how we continue connecting each distinct network to support mm -hmm. these specific use cases. Thank you, and I know Tobias Adrian, who's giving the keynote, uh, in a little bit will be talking about IMF's approaches as well, but I just want you to give a preview of the XE platform for our audience. A little bit, Federico, <laughs> okay. if you can. Um, so maybe, so the, that work, of course, I mean, we, we are not in the business of building anything yes, or, or, or running or operating systems. Um, but uh, that work that we put in the public basically was uh, our effort to start thinking conceptually of how an FMI, as Tony said and Jennifer said, an FMI that would, do, that would be multi-currency, mm -hmm. potentially multi-asset as well, how would that work yeah. and what benefits it could bring? Um, I think that's blue sky thinking, right? Yeah. Because we, on purpose, remove a lot of the frictions and hard things that exist in the real world, uh, as we, I'm sure we'll talk about the legal and regulatory issues more. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I think one of the main messages is, if we start building, I mean, conceptually, right? If we, if we let bridges and interlinking systems to proliferate, that's gonna create a lot of inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. It's gonna create a lot of cost for even smaller players because it's just more costly to manage more interconnections. It's gonna create operational risks and increase the attack surface of, of uh, bridges and systems. 
and it makes a lot of sense conceptually to have all the information and allow for automation that Ethereum and programmability can, can deliver to live on one FMI. Of course, it's very hard to think in the real world, right? We may, and hopefully, we'll end up in a second or third best world in which <coughs> some countries may have different platforms, different solutions, or different assets will be traded in different platforms or different solutions. But I think that we, what we should aim for realistically is to to help the market and the countries to converge in solutions that are compatible, that have basic functionalities, basic rules, that are all compliant with, our, with the standards that we, uh, the different standard set of bodies uh, require. Um, and then allow for these platforms and solutions to talk to each other at the <coughs> basic level. So have a limited number of uh, interconnections and have the opportunity to, to reap the benefits of of platforms and new technologies. Thank you, um, and um, I think what we're seeing here as we talk through all of these projects is a bifurcation of interoperability models, right? There's one understanding of interoperability, which is that there's gonna be a common platform of some sort. It looks different across the different models that we've looked at that everyone is going to operate on and build upon. Uh, and then there's a, an understanding of interoperability that's different from that, which is that people are gonna be working across different platforms. Uh, and how we build bridges across those platforms is what interoperability is about. Uh, Tom, I want to turn to you about your thoughts across those two models of interoperability. I mean, it, I think it's too early to, to tell, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we, we've been working at SWIFT with, with Tony and the, and the group of banks, not only because it's a really clever idea, but it's really a, a compelling uh, a view of the future, right, and what, what could be. We don't know how it's going to play out, uh, but we've kind of set the stage to run the POC. So even from kind of early white papers, you know, in the U.S., U.K., we've been working with Tony and the and the banks and others on this area. And that might turn into you know the technology that drives a unified ledger. Yeah. You know, we'd love to work with the IMF. We'd love to work with with BIS. We think these are really compelling. You know, if we end up with you know in that scenario with a unified ledger, um, you know, and that probably is going to be powered by an FMI, um, unless we decide to change how you know settlement works and the definition and legal. Con constructs which nobody's talking about, so it probably won't happen. Um, today we have over 230 market infrastructures that are connected to SWIFT. So it's, it's kind of what we do, right? So we, we'd love to, to, to be involved in that. Um, as you said, there's also other options. And so at the beginning of this year, it's been a pretty busy year in, in CBDC in the innovation and exploration. In the beginning of the year, we, we um, published a paper and built a beta for a uh, CBDC sandbox, which is banked on based on the interlinking model. So pretty closely um, aligned with what BIS called Model 2 and, uh, and does call Model 2. And in that interlinking was the idea that we'd be technology agnostic in terms of new uh, network, te the, ne the technology would be driving the new network, whether that was a blockchain or DLT based or more tr traditional centralized technology. And then we connect that back into existing payment rails. We rolled that out to and, and talked to a number of our our clients in the community, central banks and commercial banks. We got really good feedback and encouragements and we actually built a beta. Uh, and we've run the beta through the kind of the first phase. Um, two things that came out of that, one is encouragement and some additional use cases that our, our members would like to look at, including uh, payments, uh, trade, sorry, payments tied to trade, uh, DVP, uh, and even some FX use cases, which we think are really interesting in addition to the interlinking with CBDCs. Um, and we have central banks that are actually planning and will publicly announce results from the testing that they're doing on our sandbox using this interlinking solution. So the HKMA will publish results, I, I think probably early part of next mm -hmm. year, and, the, and the, uh, the Bank of um, Kazakhstan as well. Right, so we talk about kind of global reach and, 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 uh, and kind of exploring what, what could be. Um, we don't know which one's gonna work, so we, we wanna be involved in all of these things, we wanna help the industry and the community figure out the right, right way to do it. And we want to drive the interoperability that we, again, we think is going to be required to make these new networks and these new FMIs successful and avoid kind of future fragmentation. Uh, thank you. I, I do want to move beyond the theoretical now and focus a little bit on, on the choices that central banks and commercial enterprises face today. Um, when we uh, had our chat about this panel prep, we talked quite a bit about who do they go to and who do they go with when it comes to interoperability solutions? Mm -hmm. uh, Jen, I'm gonna turn to you first. 
about uh, trying to explain this conversation to a commercial bank or a central bank that's coming to you? Yeah. So this is a really important part of the conversation because right now banks or any market participant really can't afford to invest in multiple competing solutions. It's an incredible amount of technology debt to run down one type of solution, let's say on one protocol, and then watch the market move to another one after two or three years and build your internal expertise take on the technology debt of bringing that new protocol into your organization, thinking about how your clients, your members are going to connect with it, and oscillating between the changes that will be coming with solution uh, decisions as this technology and our market's use of it evolves. That is a significant burden to take on. And so through some very painful lessons, the market is watching and we have seen some things that did not work out well in you know, the last year or so. And we've also seen some successful implementations that again, to call back to the first point that I made, have unintentionally created this fragmented marketplace, fragmented liquidity pools, proprietary DLTs. So how do we think about an organization actually making these hard decisions when they have P&L costs up front and then they understand that thing, this is not a stagnant decision. This will evolve, this will change. And the reality is, is that no one has a crystal ball here. We don't know what the solution landscape's gonna look like over the next few years and certainly in the next five to 10. So again, what we need to be thinking about is where are we at right now? And where we're at right now is the marketplace has already created distinct networks that right now are predominantly single asset networks. And we've got to figure out how we can connect those together. And as these uh, market participants are making their choices, another component in addition to the technological and financial based ones that I just shared with you, another component is you know, how they're actually pr prioritizing that. And they're going to make their decision or a component uh, uh, criteria is going to prioritize what are their local needs right now. And so when we think about more aspirational, globally harmonized solutions, these are very important. And if that horse starts to pull ahead, like I said before, DTCC is gonna support that type of architecture. But right now what we're seeing in terms of implementation, whether it's experimentation or paths of production, is we're seeing localized solutions that are creating this fragmented marketplace that as a result are positioning us to think about bridging to support interoperability as opposed to creating a more visionary and granted incredibly efficient but much more visionary and unfortunately less pragmatic with the, the you know, hand of cards we're currently dealt with right now. So. Thank you, Jennifer. We're going to turn to something that we've alluded a few times, and one of the themes of this conference is developing international standards. We've talked a lot about legal and regulatory pathways to interoperability. Tony, I want to turn to you on your um, thoughts on legal harmonization uh, for models going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I think referring back to my previous comments, the, the, the fundamental overlay needs to be an FMI, um, because the problem that we're trying to solve in DLT is legal finality of settlement. And that's something specific, which is best achieved within an, an FMI. And also drilling into, again, the question of what is DLT actually good for? Um, you know, what it's, uh, just get by an analogy, imagine that you're trying to organize a, a dinner party with 10 people. Is it easier to organize that dinner party through email or through WhatsApp? It's easier to organize through WhatsApp, but why? Because everyone knows the current state. And in today's financial system, everyone doesn't know the current state. Because in the world, there are 20,000 institutions sending messages to each other essentially through secure email. So what we really want to get to is a place where banks and other financial, uh, non banks and non-banks can transact with each other and settle with, the, with each other with, with the state being unequivocal and unambiguous. 
within a legal framework provided by an, an FMI. So the multi-currency FM, a multi-currency FMI already exists. It's called CLS, Continuous Linked Settlement. It's not impossible for international organizations to get together to build that. But CLS is also a cautionary tale because the, the stimulus for CLS was the collapse of Bankhouse Herstatt in 1974, and CLS was created in, in the early 2000s. Mm. So hopefully we can get consensus about building new settlement venues faster than we built CLS. And this is another, I think, key point, which is um, the technology is obviously is often leading in this conversation. The mousetrap is often leading. What really should be leading is a consensus about what kind of settlement venues we want to build. And that consensus needs to form as a, as a public-private consensus. And then we can go on and build something new. And my last comment, I know we're running out of time, is my view is rebuilding existing silos with DLTs and then connecting them together is pointless. Mm. So DLT, the promise of DLT is about building more powerful, more general purpose settlement venues than we have today. Thank you, Tony. I'm, I'm gonna turn to Jordan really quickly for uh, his thoughts on steps that are needed on the regulatory policy side to enable interoperability. Yeah, so I'll just make two brief points. Um, the first is I, I agree with um, much of what's already been suggested that when we think about uh, new ways of achieving interoperability, whether it's through the, the linkage model or the common platform model. Um, many of the most difficult challenges are regulatory, legal, uh, policy sorts of questions, and technology can help with these, um, but is unlikely to, to be a silver bullet by itself. Um, the, the, the second point um, is that when we work on these issues, we're not starting from scratch. Um, you know, uh, the concept of, of an FMI um, has come up repeatedly in this conversation. Um, fortunately, we already have the principles for financial market infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to other issues, areas where there are regulatory gaps or new standards that have to be developed, uh, we have existing institutions um, that we can leverage to, to make progress. And the, these would include the G7, the G20, um, the Financial Stability Board, CPMI, FATF, um, and so surely there's much that uh, needs to be done, but um, we, we do have venues in place that we can uh, use to, to advance some of this work. Thank you, Jordan. And I've asked the panel in our prep session to end the session with a question that they all want you to think about or next step uh, in their own thought process as they think about interoperability. So I'm gonna start with Federico, who's right next to me. Thank Go you. ahead. So I think, I mean, something to bring up, given uh, <laughs> our role in, in policy making. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, and it has not come up, I think it's very important to avoid the digital divide across countries. Uh, there are new technologies that are very promising, exciting, maybe challenging to set up from a legal, legal or regulatory standpoint that will require a lot of political capital to be adopted and to be aligned. But we need to strive to make this work for the countries that are excluded or, are, or have, have more costly access to cross-border systems. Uh, and that's not a, a minor task, right? So that's one of our roles. Uh, and the other point, I think it's uh, important to design things that would lead to short-term solutions that can help us fight against fragmentation, but at the same time, keep on looking at the future and see whether they are more promising and more ambitious solutions that we may not yet see exactly how they're gonna play out, but it's very worthwhile exploring that with a lot of effort. Tony. I think a good question is, what would need to be true to enable regulated institutions to use public permissionless blockchains? At, at the moment, they don't pass what's known as third party risk management. Mm -hmm. Just a very concrete example quickly is, anything on Ethereum you've got to pay gas for, the gas gets paid to validators, a regulated firm cannot pay gas fees to sanctioned entities. So the public permissionless blockchains are, are out mm. at the moment. What would need to be true in order to enable regulated institutions mm. to occupy that space and use those networks? Tom. It's always difficult to follow Tony 
<laughs> asking like interesting questions, but I'll, I'll try. Um, the question I would ask would be, it, as we look at these new constructs, forget about the technology, forget about DLT, forget about you know, kind of how we're gonna build it. We can build it. I'm, I'm one of those people that are convinced that engineers are gonna solve, you know, the most complex problems in the world that we're facing today. You know, when we look at these solutions, how are we actually creating value? And how can we verify that it's, it's better, faster, cheaper, safer, more transparent um, than what we have today? We're not just deploying new technology um, to, to kind of solve the same problem that's already been solved and probably introduce additional new risk on top of that. So we always gotta think about how, you know, how valuable is, is how, is it really going to fit in? How is it going to work? And we need to be specific with use cases. So, you know, be, ask questions about use cases. Be specific, um, because without that, it's, we're just going to have lots of conversations for forever. Jennifer. Yes. The industry needs to take a collaborative approach to addressing some of the significant open issues that we still have around access, standards, and interoperability. We need to do this, and we need to do this sooner rather than later, because there already are organizations and governments that are moving forward quickly with a very significant amount of velocity around creating their own solutions without having these conversations. And although I don't think that that will destabilize the work that we're doing or any monetary policy uh, you know, considerations, we do need to consider that if we are silent or if we don't have a stronger voice in this conversation, then we may be positioned such that we are reverse engineering into solutions that have already been created and markets that have already been accessed as opposed to dictating a best practice that could really move the ball forward on the field. So that collaborative conversation needs to happen now, and there are lots of organizations that are doing it. Again, events like this conference, the work that RLN is doing, I can speak towards my organization and some of the work that we've done with our clients and consortiums, and I know SWIFT is doing the same, and IMF as well, and so we need to make sure that those collaborative conversations continue to take a priority. Thank you, and Jordan, you get the last question. Thank you. I I'll just pick up on uh, the theme that you identified, Ananya, of the two different uh, models for interoperability. One, the interlinkage model, and, and the uh, second being the, the common platform model. And for me, a couple of the questions that I often wonder about are, one, um, trying to get as clear as I can about the, the costs and benefits of these two approaches. Um, but second, and maybe more importantly, uh, thinking about uh, what, what's the right way forward. Um, is the right way to sort of push forward on both fronts um, and let a, a thousand flowers bloom? Um, or do we somehow need to, to have a more uh, deliberate, coordinated uh, path forward? Thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to introduce Jennifer Lassiter, who's going to dismiss us all for lunch, but also announce programming for the FinTech Hub. Thank you. <clears throat>